Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar. And today I am really excited because I have a very special guest named Nick Dominato, who you may recall is the founder of 8S Think, which leverages VIN numbers to properly identify 8S systems on the vehicle and also OEM calibration requirements and instructions. In 2020, 8S Think won a SEMA Best New Product Award and in 2021, 8S Think was acquired by Aztec. So welcome, Nick. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be here. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to also add now, currently, Nick is the CEO of Autobolt, which is a new auto glass part lookup service. But there's a question I want to ask you, Nick, and I cannot wait to ask you, but I'm going to wait. I am going to wait because the first question is, Tell me what it was like founding 8S Think, responding to a market need, founding this 8S Think company, watching it win an award at SEMA, and then get sold to another company. Tell me about that. It must have been very fulfilling for you. You know, Jason, it was fulfilling. It was scary. It was exciting. It was all of those things all at once. You know, I started working on 8S Think back in 2019. And the whole collision landscape was a lot different back then. The awareness around ADAS just wasn't there compared to where we are now. And we still have a long way to go. You know, I wish that I could say that I started ADAS in, in response to a market need. But, you know, the industry was so dysfunctional at that point. There wasn't even a need uh, for ADAS thing. And I'll, I'll kind of tell you what explain what I what I mean by that. Uh, back in 2019, 2018, 2019, I was a rep agent and I was spending a whole lot of times in shops. I had been given uh, a task to do a presentation on ADAS for driven brands. And I knew nothing about ADAS, but I said yes. And I kind of endeavored to learn about it, uh, gave the presentation and I learned kind of iCar was the only organization back then that had any uh, collection of information on ADAS. So I read through iCar, looked through their requirements, and I just thought, my God, um, these systems need to be calibrated a whole lot of times. So I would made it a habit. I would go into shops and I would just ask the owners or the managers or the technicians again, this is back in 2019, how many cars are you guys calibrating every week, every month? And the answer typically was, you know, maybe we do one or two a month. It's a pain in the butt when we have to do it. You know, some of these cars, you unplug something and, and the light goes on, but really we don't see a whole lot of it and it's a big pain to do. So going into this, I thought, wow, there's a huge need, a knowledge gap in the industry for understanding when a calibration has to be done. But in terms of a market need, if you back then, if you talk to a manager or a production manager or an owner, they would tell you, no, it's fine. As long as there's no light on, uh, we're good. So we just make sure not, not to unplug anything if we don't have to, so we don't have to do the calibration. And that's kind of where we were in 2019. Obviously we've come a long way since then, but that was the genesis of just being in the shops, talking to the managers and just seeing how many cars were being shipped out without doing a calibration. That was what 8S Sync was really designed to do was help the estimators who are overworked, underpaid, pulled in 18 different directions all at one time, just give them an easy way to upload their estimate and identify all the required calibrations and give them the documentation so that they can get paid. Wow. You know, so you were ahead of your time. I mean, we think about three years ago, gosh, that wasn't that long ago, right? But in terms of ADAS and technology and where we've gone, it was a long time ago. And it's amazing to me uh, what you just said, that it wasn't even on people's radar uh, at the time. So you were sort of ahead of your time. And here we are in the thick of it in 2023. And I think the industry understands that every car needs a pre-scan, every car needs a post-scan. Um, cars need calibrations depending on the procedure you're doing and what the OEM says. And um, there's a whole lot more calibration that need to be done that, that aren't being done right now. So that is interesting. So now my question I want, I've been dreaming about this. I've been thinking about this for three weeks, Nick. 
This is the question I want to ask you. You steered me to some articles you wrote that are online, and they were quite shocking to me. And one of them was, you wrote an article about how the liability factor in ADOS repairs is being massively overblown. And that just blew my mind because all we talk about in body shop business is liability, liability. The liability is growing. There's always been liability in this business, but it has exponentially grown now because of these advanced uh, a, a driver assistance systems that are really related to the safety of the vehicle and the driver. You're saying it's overblown. What do you mean? Correct, Jason. I, I think it's being massively overblown. But before I go into it, I think that there's two types of liability we can kind of pull apart. One part is what I might call comeback liability. So that's if you don't do a calibration or you do it improperly and the customer comes back a day later or a week later or a month later complaining about the systems. The shop sends it to the dealer or redoes the calibration. And it's not a liability in the sense of a legal liability. No one's getting hurt. But you do have a liability in terms of you're spending extra time. You've got your CSI scores are probably going to drop. You've got to come back to deal with. I think that is a big problem when it comes to liability and when it comes to doing improper ADAS calibrations. And that happens all the time. When I'm talking about liabilities massively overblown, I'm talking about legal liability. And the reason I say that is because of the massive dysfunction in our industry we can pretty confidently say that, you know, the consequences of not doing calibrations are not high. And let me just give you a bit of context. Uh, when I started ADAS Think, we did a study where we took a look at 100 estimates and we found those 100 estimates with, a, with at least one calibration, they were missed on the estimate 88% of the time. So out of 115 uh, calibrations, there's something like 88 were, were identified. Millions of carbs have been you know, um, returned to their owners. We know generally our stats on ADAS sync, and we've made this public, uh, generally about a 20% calibration rate. So if a shop is uh, you know, fixing 50 cars a month, they're probably gonna be doing about 10 calibrations. They should be doing 10 calibrations based on 50 cars at a minimum, some vehicles may require more than one calibration, so that number might be a little bit higher, but about 20% of the cars, very conservatively, will need a calibration. So if you say, look, we've fixed 6 million vehicles, uh, roughly 6 million vehicles a year, uh, and 88% of them are being missed, we have shipped literally millions of vehicles back to their customers without those systems being calibrated. And we haven't seen a single uh, lawsuit. We haven't seen a John Eagle case. And, you know, it's unfortunate that the reason why I'm saying that the liability is low is because of the massive dysfunction in our industry and, and the total lack of doing calibrations. But there's really no other conclusion that we can draw if we say, look, we've shipped millions of cars without doing a calibration and nobody has been able to point to a single lawsuit. The only conclusion we can come to after piecing those two facts together is, well, it's probably not a big legal liability for these repairers uh, at the end of the day. Wow. And did you, do you think that repairers are going to watch this now and go, oh, it's okay then I don't, that I don't do calibrations? So, you know, I think that there's always going to be a cohort of shops who kind of can will take any excuse they can get to justify their behavior. And you know what they would be doing? They'd be, be doing the same thing whether or not um, there'd be this article or not. Um, this kind of goes back to, is it important to tell the truth all the time or is it important to fudge it a little bit in order to get people to do the right thing? And I think both uh, kind of trains of thought are valid. But for me, I think, you know, it's we have enough time and enough data now where we can pretty confidently say that, look, you know, the, the risk of, from a legal liability standpoint, of not doing calibrations just isn't there. That doesn't mean that it's not important to do the calibration. That doesn't mean that you can, that it's not important to fix the car properly, that you can make money while doing it. We know that the gross margins on calibrations are, are very um, high for repairs. So you can fix the car properly. You can make good money doing it. 
And you don't have to deal with that other liability that I spoke about earlier, which is the customer coming back, the customer complaining, the car not, uh, you know, dealing with subletting it out and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying that it's not important to do calibrations. Some people will take what I'm saying and use it to justify their behavior, which in my opinion, they would be doing anyway. But, you know, we have to do calibrations. We have to fix the car properly, but we also have to be truthful with the risks and the opportunities. And we can't just say anything just because it's going to sell a product or get people to do the right thing. So did you see the recent uh, study by, I think it was the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety that said that 50% of consumers that had uh, collision repairs done affecting their ADAS systems had problems with the ADAS after the fact? Um, it was quite an alarming uh, study and it, it sort of validated for some people that, hey, there's a lot of body shops that either A, aren't doing calibrations or doing them wrong. Yeah, definitely. And that kind of speaks to that first liability risk, which is the systems probably aren't functioning properly. You're going to have customers complain. Um, so there, that's definitely a big part of it. In my opinion, I, if you talk to any body shop owner or painter, they'll also tell you how many customers you know, will come back and take a look at their vehicle and, and they'll tell you, hey, my bumper doesn't match the rest of my car but they painted the, the back bumper and they're looking at the front. And of course it never matched in the first place. And really consumers, where I'm getting at is consumers just tend to pay a whole lot more attention to these systems after the vehicle's being repaired. And they might be attributing a faulty system to really just, you know, to the body shop when really it wasn't that great to begin with. And I'll give you an example. I mean, if you take a look at an old Hyundai, Kia or Honda lane departure system, you know, a 2015 or 2016 model year vehicle, those systems by design in the service information are only designed to work after the car has traveled 30% across the line. Only at that point will it give you a warning or bring you back in the lane. So there, I'm sure there's tons of examples where customers don't notice it, get their car repaired, and then they notice, oh my God, my car drifts 30% over the line before the lane departure, something's wrong. Well, actually, that's the kind of the way that it was always intended to work. It's just not that good of a system to begin with. So yes, shops are not doing calibrations properly or missing them, and that is causing the systems to malfunction. But also, I think if we're being truthful with ourselves, we also have to say, look, you know, customers sometimes pay a little bit closer to attention to these things after the car is being repaired, and sometimes have a tendency to misattribute the car's faults to the repairer when maybe they pre-existed uh, being in an accident. I, I think you're right. I experienced that many years ago when I got my car repaired and, it, and the car looked great. And I'd been driving a rental car for two weeks. I get in my car and I'm like, what did you guys do to my car? Like, is the, my car was driving terrible, but it was because I was in a brand new rental car with very low mileage, you know? So I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, uh, the, the custom, you know, what, what body shops have to deal with on a daily basis from customers. Um, the other question I had for you, there was another article that you wrote saying that it doesn't matter whether you, you use an OEM or an aftermarket windshield when it comes to camera calibrations. And again, I've talked to many experts in the field who say it absolutely does. In fact, um, if there's a calibration issue, one of the first things the dealer is going to look at is, what kind of glass you install? Because that's the starting point. Because it could be, you know, uh, so many things that that were the, is the problem. But tell tell me that this this is crazy. Because I, I, again, I, I've had all kinds of experts tell me the glass absolutely matters. So it was a little bit of a play on words. My article. Uh, what I was getting at is the glass itself actually doesn't matter. There have been a number of studies done where they found. When you talk about the thickness or the curvature or the transmissivity of the glass, aftermarket and OEM are functionally equivalent. There's no difference. And they've done things like shot a laser through both of them, uh, done all kinds of measurements, tested the thickness. There's really no difference between aftermarket and OEM when it comes to that. Now, there may be times where an aftermarket has kind of a higher failure rate where there might be a little bit more curvature. So every automaker and every 
kind of glass manufacturer does have a tolerance. It can be that aftermarket um, might have a failure rate that's a little bit higher. So it might be the case that, that it could be wavier in the middle compared to an OEM. But in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it has nothing to do with the glass. And that's what I meant when I said the windshield doesn't matter. Where it does come into play is the placement of the bracket. And that is the cause of the fault in nine times out of 10 is not the glass. And that's why I said the windshield doesn't matter. It's not the glass. It's the placement of the bracket itself. And, you know, even on OEM assembly lines, uh, you still have in, on some lines workers who are hand placing those brackets on the glass. And so when you talk about the ability of, of that bracket to be in the wrong place, um, that's where the aftermarket uh, windshields tend to do a much worse job. When you do a calibration, the whole point is to correct for the pitch, the yaw, and the angles of the camera. And calibration can correct for those within a tolerance, right? So if it's pitched up by half a degree or it's got a roll of 0 0.8 degrees, you do the calibration, it records those parameters and it corrects for them. But if you have a bracket that is off by three centimeters, the camera is not even close to being where it should be. You cannot calibrate your way out of that situation. What, we've, what OEMs have found, what aftermarket manufacturers have found, is that the cause, the overwhelming cause of these issues isn't the glass. It's not that you're putting on a new pair of glasses or all these kinds of metaphors that people in the industry use to say that why the glass is important. It's just the fact that the after, in the aftermarket, typically the placement of the bracket is not as good. That's improving, certainly, but that's where I was going. And I would kind of stand behind that, that if you took any piece of aftermarket glass, at least high quality aftermarket glass, and compared it to the OEM glass, you wouldn't have any functional differences. You really got to look at that placement of the bracket. Wow. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so I also wanted to talk about your new company, AutoBolt. Um, in fact, you and I kind of reunited via email uh, a few weeks back um, because you sent me some a new study that AutoBolt had done on the Autoglass ADASIN technology. Um, and that was a pretty eye-opening report. And in fact, I, I got to tell you, I'm going to be using some of those stats in an upcoming issue of Body Shop Business. And of course, I'll credit AutoBolt. But um, tell me uh, 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 some of the eye-opening uh, stats that came out of the study for you. Sure. So, you know, the headline numbers is calibration in the auto glass industry alone is already a billion dollar industry. I one billion with a B. One billion with a B. Uh, if every glass installer did the calibration for a windshield with lean departure, there should have been 3.8 million calibrations done in 2022 based on the car park. And if you say it's an average price of about $250, that gets you to a billion dollar industry. So we know, and by the way, this is growing at a rapid pace. So 3.8 million, I ran the numbers back and for the for 2023, once that's done, the number will be 4 million plus. So we're seeing a compound annual growth rate in, the, in calibrations and glass in the double digits. It's wild how fast this segment of the market is growing. And the reason why is because these automakers are just racing to catch up with this voluntary agreement to equip every vehicle with forward collision warning and auto emergency braking. So at, typically the way to do that, these automakers have done it by putting the camera behind the windshield, which is responsible for that forward collision warning function. So in order to meet those voluntary targets to put AEB on vehicles by 2022, they have done that via the windshield camera, which means we need, we're gonna see a whole lot of calibration. So in 2023, 90% uh, of vehicles in production, uh, based on our numbers, have a windshield camera uh, attached to it and a calibration required after a windshield replacement. And that's up from something uh, like less than 20% in 2015. So again, just incredible growth in this technology. Wow. And yep, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those customers. I am now a calibration customer. I just got a 2023 Honda Civic. I upgraded from a 2009 Honda Civic with 215,000 miles, and I now have a windshield camera. So hopefully, well, no, 
I don't want to be a customer someday for calibration um, because that would mean I got in a collision. But um, absolutely, I, all have, I have all the bells and whistles now and I'm experiencing that on a daily basis. And uh, boy, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's convenient to drive in the car for a while now. And um, I'll tell you, I'm used to the, the features now and I'm, I'm glad for them. Um, the other day, I, I think I was tailgating somebody and all of a sudden I got a, a big uh, uh, yellow rectangle that came up that said, break, break, break. And I think um, I crossed a, a speed threshold and a distance threshold where that came on, like it was going to get in a collision. But maybe I shouldn't tailgate. Maybe that's the lesson from that. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, and that does highlight the risk with 8S. And this is an issue that NHTSA and, and the IHS has, have explored, which is just a, an amazing number of drivers turn these systems off because they're annoyed by them. My father is one of them. I'm one of them. My wife's got a Volvo and it does that same thing. If you're if you're too close, it, a yellow icon appears and it kind of grows in brightness uh, as you get closer to the car. A lot of people don't like that, including myself when I'm driving. Um, this is just kind of to put the truth out there. I probably drive way too close to other vehicles and I don't like it when my car tells me that I'm driving too close. So I would rather myself personally being in the industry, I would rather turn that system off than have it annoy me all the time. And so this kind of goes back a little bit to what I talked about on the liability side. I mean, when you've got half the drivers in, uh, you know, who have eight ass who have turned them off. I mean, you know, the sad fact is as a repairer, you, you might be doing a calibration, which again, you have to do. Uh, you might be doing this calibration, return it to the car. And the first thing the customer does is turn it off. Now, the automakers are starting to uh, make certain functions untoggleable. So typically, you know, your forward collision warning or your auto emergency braking are often things you can't turn off. But uh, my father doesn't turn on lane departure in his Toyota because he doesn't like that it beeps at him. And there are millions and millions of drivers who do that. Now, you can't, I know you said it, uh, you don't want to get into a collision, but if you get your windshield replaced, that's going to need a calibration. It's interesting. One of the things that we looked at in our report was this whole issue of static versus dynamic and where the industry is going. It's been a constant source of debate uh, where the OEMs are going. And Honda is actually a great idea, uh, an example, because Honda in their 2023 model year vehicles are switching to a, a static or dynamic calibration where typically Honda vehicles were static or both. Um, the 2023 Civic, for example, you can actually do static or dynamic. And so what we're seeing uh, and this, we talked about it in, this, in our report, is a trend of automakers actually giving repairers the choice to do either a static calibration or a dynamic calibration. So all of this conversation that we've been having in the industry about shop space requirements and equipment, that's never going to go away. There are certain calibrations where you're always going to need the equipment. And of course, the vehicles that have already been produced that are a static calibration are going to have to be done that way. But I think over time, we're going to see a continuing trend of repairs permitting either a static calibration or a dynamic. And we've seen that with a Hyundai, Kia, and Mazda were kind of the first to kind of pioneer that. But we've seen Toyota pick on that, pick up on that starting in 2022, 20, 23. Honda has, Volkswagen, Audi's picked up on that. And I think that's going to be a trend that we continue. And that's really something to celebrate because it means less complexity for repairs, greater ability to do the calibration. I live up north. If we're in December, January, February, and it just snowed, you know what? You can't do it stat uh, dynamic calibration because it's probably going to be a traffic jam. And if it just snowed, the line, the lane lines aren't there. On the other hand, when you talk about a static calibration, it's a huge investment in equipment and it's a big learning curve for people to understand how to do those calibrations properly. And you run into all of those issues like your environmental requirements, your lighting, level floor, full tank of gas, um, you know, your your tire pressure. So allowing a repairer to choose, as we have seen, and, and as your 2023 Honda probably has, especially if it's a Civic, um, you know what? If we're early in the state, if I'm a shop and I haven't, you know, really mastered this calibration equipment, maybe I'll take it on a dynamic calibration. And if it's snowing or if it's rainy or if it's rush hour, 
then I'll also have the choice to do that static portion of the calibration instead of the dynamic. And that's a big win for the industry. And that's something that we've seen kind of rise in prominence just this last two or three years. Yeah, interesting. Uh, choices are good, right? That, that'll that be music to repairers' ears, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So so if uh, if, if repairers want to access this, this study you did, where can they go? Yep. So they can go to our website, which is myautobolt.com. Our website is there. Resources are there and all, and all of our links are there where they can get in touch with me. Uh, my email is nick at myautobolt.com. Wonderful. And shameless plug for Body Shop Business. We also have the study on bodyshopbusiness.com. Correct. So uh, Nick, I want to thank you for being on the uh, podcast today. Uh, great information. Uh, this is a, a little bit more new information than we've offered uh, in past episodes. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit bodyshopbusiness.com.